The President, Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali led government, has embarked on a seven pillar transformational agenda, which includes infrastructure, technology, services, energy security, food security, and mental transformation. On the energy front, the Gas to Energy Project, the head of state said, is national and transformational in nature, one that cuts across various sectors. It is directly linked to poverty reduction, opening up of opportunities, the creation of new growth poles and hubs, and will bring direct benefits to the pockets of people. What we are projecting to do, all things being equal, is to have cooking gas available substantially less. When I say substantially, substantially. We're not going to tell you about pie, pie in the sky that, are, that is unsustainable, that free cooking gas for every single human. That is unsustainable. It is fairy tale and take us nowhere. I am telling you about delivering cooking gas to you. I said the market size is 10.1 billion. But delivering cooking gas at a price that would save $7 billion of what the market is now. That is $7 billion of savings going back to the household. So in cooking gas and electricity, we are talking about $27 billion that goes back in the pockets of people, goes back in the household. The country could save billions of dollars per month from electricity costs and the cost of cooking gas. Through the project, there'll be the establishment of a gas processing plant, GPP, and a natural gas liquids, NGL facility, which will be capable of producing at least 4,000 barrels per day, including the fractionation of liquefied petroleum gas, LPG. We are staying true to achieving the more than 400 megawatts. We are staying true to resilient, stable, affordable energy. And we are staying true to the commitment of delivering electricity at half the price the consumers are paying now. So in terms of the manifesto, we have passed the test of soundness. We have passed the test of soundness. It's a very feasible project that would allow us to to expand our economy, to cut our carbon emissions, and to ensure that we um, that our development strategy gets implemented. You have to have world-class infrastructure. You have to be able to address people's basic needs, education in education, health care, community roads, secure the country. Following the signing of an agreement between Guyana, the Kingdom of Norway, and the Inter-American Development Bank, IDB, the reality of Guyana's goal to transition to renewable energy is now even closer. On June 22, the three parties signed an agreement to finance Guyana's largest solar project, set to benefit thousands of Guyanese. The project is aligned with Guyana's low-carbon ambitions under the new and expanded Low-Carbon Development Strategy, LCDS 2030. Guyana has successfully maintained 85% of its forest cover, with a deforestation rate that is 90% lower than other tropical countries. Since 2009, under the previous PPPC government, Guyana received approximately 220 million US dollars as results-based payments from Norway under the first phase of the LCDS. These funds have been invested in the country's low carbon development financing renewable energy, flood protection, green job creation, as well as land titling and development of funds for indigenous peoples. Solar energy generation is just one component of Guyana's low carbon goals under the LCDS. Under this national advancement plan, Guyana looks to complement the grid with other forms of clean and renewable energy, namely natural gas, 
hydropower, wind power, and even biomass. It is anticipated that by 2030, 70% of Guyana's energy mix will be supplied through green energy. Prime Minister Phillips, who also holds responsibility for energy, said the revenue generated from the oil and gas sector will improve infrastructure, bridge the digital divide and transform the energy sector with a focus on renewable energy. We have a government that is committed to utilizing the revenue, as you heard before, from oil and gas to bring development to all the people of Guyana. And it's very important that I mention all the people of Guyana. For far too long, as a country, we have struggled with developing our country and improving the lives of the people of Guyana. Today, we have a resource and we as a government committed ourselves to utilizing that resource to improve the life and livelihood of all the people of Guyana. The PPPC in its manifesto committed to empowering women and taking care of children and vulnerable groups through the provision of enhanced benefits for public assistance recipients. The incremental increase in old age pension as well as improved conditions for persons with special needs, including children, through better facilities, services, and job opportunities. Government had earmarked some $2 billion in August 2021 to increase old age pension from $20,500 to $25,000 monthly. This year, some $2.3 billion was allocated to increase old age pension from $25,000 to $28,000 monthly, which will see 65,000 senior citizens benefiting nationwide. In 2021, public assistance increased from $9,000 to $12,000, and this year it has increased to $14,000. Electricity credit was provided to about 50,000 vulnerable households, including pensioners. A total of 27,436 pensioners are also receiving water subsidies. Further, His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali announced on the 3rd of June that each child with a disability would be receiving a cash grant of $100,000. The President made the welcomed announcement during a meeting with parents and their special needs children at State House. The head of state, who was accompanied by First Lady Mrs. Arya Ali, said that the government has a lot of plans under its One Guyana umbrella to offer assistance to all Guyanese. Based on the register, we want to give every single child with disability a cash grant of $100,000 this year. So this this uh, would be an added uh, incentive that we can help. We, we want to do more. We are working on areas in which we can do more. We're working on uh, the methodology that can be best utilized to deliver more to you. Minister of Human Services and Social Security, Dr. Vindya Prasad, was also at the meeting, which aimed to find ways to improve the lives of all persons with disabilities by hearing directly from the parents. The president said plans are in place to have a classroom in every region that is dedicated to helping children with disabilities. After listening to a number of parents, the president announced that moving forward, he would ensure that all the children on the register are entitled to automatic public assistance. Public assistance is also now extended to persons living with HIV and cancer. Also, the Board of Industrial Training, BIT, and the Women Innovation Investment Network, WIN, are providing training opportunities for persons with disabilities. The ministry is also providing transportation for children with disabilities to attend school. Working with the office of the First Lady, the government also plans to construct a business center for persons with disabilities or PWDs in every region. President Ali noted that this year,
the first such center will be built in Region 6. Over two dozen persons are expected to gain employment in the short term at each center, with the possibility of it increasing to over three dozen in the medium to long term. In keeping with its manifesto promise, the government, through the Human Services Ministry, has launched a number of programs aimed at empowering women across the country. Minister Dr. Vindya Prasad has been proactive, traveling the length and breadth of Guyana, meeting with vulnerable groups, listening to their concerns and ensuring that they benefit from these initiatives. We also look towards creating an inclusive society where women and girls who are differently able can have the same training opportunities as those of us. As such, the Ministry will embark on an aggressive movement to ensure that we harness the skills, the talent, the creative abilities, the very essence of the women of our country, so that we can create what I would love to see, a world where women not only feel safe and secure, but they are allowed to achieve their fullest potential. The President Ali-led government is working to spread the tourism dollar throughout the country. The objective is not only to attract foreigners to Guyana, but to have more Guyanese exploring this beautiful country. Guyana this year secured the rights to host the next three CPL finals. There is also a carnival component to the games. Guyana is establishing itself as a destination to host large conferences and events. President Ali at the launch of the Cricket Carnival and the Caribbean Premier League 2022 at the Guyana National Stadium Providence on March 30th said, the most sought after event will not be limited to bat and ball sessions, but a host of organized events to promote massive camaraderie between participants, thus ensuring the One Guyana Banner is upheld. A journey in which we are building not only sectors, but we are building communities we are bringing people together. We are unifying our country. And there is no better way than through sports and culture. The governments of Guyana and Barbados have agreed to train 6,000 Guyanese in hospitality in preparation for the establishment of several branded hotels currently under construction and the growing tourism industry. The local hospitality training institution at Port Morant will be the hallmark for the sector. This is in keeping with the government's commitment to creating a conducive and enabling environment for investors. 3,000 Guyanese are also being targeted by the Guyana Tourism Authority to undergo training to dispense the quality of service expected by tourists. The PPPC government believes that Region 9 has tremendous tourism potential. In this regard, heavy investment is being made to enhance the tourism product in the north, south, and central Rupununi. Building a product like this requires investment. Making Rupununi and Region 9 a staple in the tourism menu in our country requires investment. Many of you drove the road or the trail coming in. I have good news for you. We have already awarded a contract to rebuild all the bridges in the international concrete standard from Linden all the way into Latem. Furthermore, we, are, we have already commenced the signing of the project to pave the highway from Linden to Mabura Hill. And we're exploring different formula in having the bridge completed and then road paved all the way here to Latham. Communities in central Rupununi, including Napi and St. Ignatius, Minister Walron said, continue to enjoy the support of the tourism ministry. And this year we'll see works being done at the Kumu and Mokomoko Falls. In the south, the GTA is working with stakeholders to develop 10 new tourism products and will also provide training and marketing of them. In addition, some 200 persons from the Rupununi 
will be trained this year in the culinary arts, events management, and tour guides. The predicted growth should inspire confidence for more people to invest in quality accommodation and service to meet the rapidly increasing demand. More people would have been here if they were able to secure accommodation. And it is therefore imperative that we pay serious attention to this as we look at the bigger picture and we project to a brighter future. Ladies and gentlemen, let them and Region 9 possesses tremendous potential. We have some genuine products here in their raw form and our Amerindian communities offer authentic insight into the way of life of the indigenous communities. However, potential without action and ingenuity remains just potential. To translate potential to tangible benefits require deliberate and insightful action. The government is committed to building a more inclusive and sustainable future for Amerindians and hinterland residents. In its manifesto, the PPPC assured that the rights of Amerindians and their access to opportunities will be high on its agenda, with emphasis on infrastructure development in villages, creating job opportunities, and improving social services. The Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali administration has been visiting indigenous communities, restating to residents that Amerindian development continues to be an integral part of the government's agenda. The government has spent a whopping $10 billion on advancing the cause of Amerindians in less than two years by implementing projects, plans, and initiatives that cater to their needs. Every successive PP civic government was to do the best we can do for Amerindian communities and Amerindian people. Not just because we want to do it, but because you are no different from the rest of the population and you must be treated in the same respect, with the same dignity and honor like all of the population. Those are the fundamental principles that we adhere to, that we support. Government has set aside financial resources in 2022 to start a national consultation as part of plans to revise the Amerindian Act of 2006. The Amerindian Act provides for the recognition and protection of collective rights of Amerindian villages and communities in Guyana and the promotion of good governance. Apart from this legislative intervention, the PPPC government is in the process of shoring up Amerindian empowerment through a number of budgeted programs and plans. The Community Service Officers CSO's program, which was disbanded and replaced by the former administration, was relaunched in 2020. And so far, more than 2,500 officers are gainfully employed. Further, these CSOs were trained in core skills to address their community's needs, computer literacy, solar installation and maintenance to support tractor driving and maintenance, and water systems management. Hinterland youths are now receiving skills training under the Board of Industrial Training Program. After assuming office, the government expanded the training programs to hinterland communities. Before this, the programs were only administered to persons living on the coastland. Following the signing of a Memorandum of Understanding, MOU, between the Ministries of Labor and Amerindian Affairs, CSOs are also beneficiaries of these training programs. After a two-year hiatus, the National Tushaus Council Conference opened at the Arthur Chung Conference Center on July 11th. During the ceremony, seven Amerindian communities received absolute grants and certificates of title for their lands. The villages of Kapui and Mashabo, Pomeroon, Supanam, Region 2, received absolute grants for extension of approximately 13 square miles and 14.5 square miles of lands respectively. Certificates of title for extensions were handed over to the Tushaus of St. Monica and Mainstay Wayaka along the Essequibo coast 
and Yupakari, Upper Takatu, Upper Essequibo, Region 9. Meanwhile, Tushaus Alvin Joseph and Alfred Joseph of Tassarine and Kangaruma, Kayuni Mazaruni, Region 7, respectively also received their certificates of title. Land titling remains paramount on our government's agenda. This speaks volume of the effort to address land titling and demarcation of lands to Amerindians across our country. This is a far cry from the legacy left by the APNU AFC administration, where no villages received their titles or had their land demarcation completed in their five years. The ministry is pursuing the approval for two years extension for accomplishing once and for all the completion of titling and demarcation of Amerindian lands. Tushaus and Deputy Tushaus will also benefit from a 50% increase in their stipends moving from $30,000 to $45,000 and $20,000 to $30,000 respectively. Senior councillors of Amerindian communities and regional councillors will also benefit from increases. Under the Presidential Grants Initiative so far, the PPPC government has invested $880 million in over 131 projects that span all 10 administrative regions inclusive of agricultural, transportation, business enterprise, and infrastructural projects. A total of 115 infrastructural projects were completed. Bridges, village offices and multi-purpose buildings valued at $172 million, while a total of 73 small businesses and agricultural projects started in villages, cattle and poultry rearing, cassava cultivation and processing, and village shops valued at $88 million to date. President Ali, who is also the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, back in March 2021, had highlighted that the Guyana Police Force must undertake restructuring, repositioning, rebranding, reorganizing, retooling, re-engineering, and the repairing of its image and service delivery. The Head of State also committed his government support throughout this process. The administration has been following through with its commitment to the security sector. Over $830 million was spent on construction, rehabilitating and maintaining police stations including Providence, Rheinvelt, Coven John, Albion, Wim, Parika and Wismar. 29 persons completed the prosecutor's training program to become prosecutors within the magistrate's court as part of the goal to promote a higher rate of conviction for serious crimes. Another batch of 57 ranks were trained in ICT and 24 others in cybercrime investigation. Minister of Home Affairs Robson Ben said, for far too long, there has been a negative light on police prosecutors. This, he said, is one of the reasons government made the investment to improve the quality of police prosecutors in the court system. Those who will stand up in the magistrate's courts, those who will do the documentation, put together the evidence in relating to prosecuting cases, have to be of high integrity, have to have a high level of dispassionate engagement in respect of the work that they have to do. The Guyana Police Force GPF expanded its use of CCTVs in conjunction with the National Emergency Response Command Center, Automatic Fingerprint Identification System, AFIS, and Integrated Compliance Information System, ICIS, satellite phones and smart computer high-frequency HF radios to boost its operational efficiency. The Crime Statistical Unit, Office of the Professional Responsibility, Audit and Inspection Unit, and Special Organized Crime Unit were established to ensure transparency and accountability. Crime and Intelligence Units were set up within each regional division to ensure decentralized crime gathering resources and capabilities across Guyana. Additionally, 12 regional divisions were equipped with crime-fighting resources and equipment. Through the government of Guyana, 
we were able to be equipped with 50 vehicles, that is the 4x4, which aid our response time and improve our visibility. We have recently received 24 more pickups, which we have also uh, distributed to the regions. But importantly, we are still to receive 32 more vehicles within the next two months. And so members of the public, you can be assured that you're gonna see police in a more visible way. You're gonna see police responding more than ever. The traffic department conducted radio broadcasts, learner driver programs, and COVID-19 emergency measures sanitization sessions with public transport operators. A total of 25 ranks attended the use of radar guns, breathalyzer, metric systems, and tire training courses. A $51.4 million fire station and $12.5 million ambulance service was established at Melanie Damishana to serve communities along the east coast of Demerara. Approximately $37.8 million was invested to complete the Eccles Fire Station to provide fire and rescue services to persons living on the east bank of Demerara from Agricola to Providence and to lend support to residents of West Demerara. The national workforce has enjoyed increased and better opportunities over the past two years. Health and safety in workplaces also took top priority by the Ministry of Labor, which was established as a separate ministry when the PPPC administration took office. There have been a number of significant achievements under the ministry led by Minister Joseph Hamilton who has been traveling across the country, meeting with employees, employers, and other citizens. Underground mining and workplace deaths were reduced by 16%, among other achievements. Job readiness workshops were held in regions three, four, and six, and in March, 2022. The Ministry of Labor established a national job bank to improve access to employment opportunities for job seekers and employers with skills gap issues. To date, 2,000 employers have utilized the platform with more than 300 jobs published. Labor offices and Board of Industrial Training, BIT training centers, were set up in regions 2, 6, 7, and 10, making it easier for residents to access these services. BIT signed an MOU with the Ministry of Amerindian Affairs to train 440 community service officers, CSOs, selected from more than 100 hinterland communities. Thus far, the agency has trained about 300. Additionally, the agency signed an MOU to deliver technical vocational and educational training, TVET, programs to members of the Guyana Police Force, the GPF. In 2020, 1,891 persons were certified in various skills. The following year, 2,199 persons were certified, and this year some 3,000 persons are being targeted for training. We don't look for qualifications. No, none of the programs ask for qualification. Because we know that many people could not end where they wanted to end because of circumstances of life. And that is what BIT is for, to ensure that people can once again dream to ensure that people can once again know that they can do things that people said they cannot do. From 2020 to 2021, the $38.2 million in wages, overtime, annual leave, and severance pay owing to workers were recovered. And for this year, some $13 million has been recouped to date. Guyana's relationship with CARICOM and other countries in the hemisphere has deepened tremendously following several engagements from attendances at regional and international forums and official visits. His Excellency Dr. Mohamed Irfan Ali and his cabinet have conducted several overseas visits that have further strengthened partnerships in several areas that will positively serve the country's development. Agreements were made with a number of countries including Kingdom of the Netherlands and Saudi Arabia Air Service Agreements, United Arab Emirates Agreement for the Promotion and Reciprocal Protection of Investment 
and a Memorandum of Understanding MOU on Technical Cooperation. Ghana, Framework Agreement on Cooperation, Cooperation in the Petroleum Sector, and Mutual Cooperation in Investment Promotion between the Guyana Office for Investment Go Invest and Ghana Investment Promotion Center. Saudi Arabia, Agreement on the Avoidance of Double Taxation, Prevention of Fiscal Evasion Concerning Taxes on Income and Capital, and an MOU on Cooperation in Government Development and Modernization. Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation Hugh Todd and Belize's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Trade and Immigration, Eamon Courtney, signed a Memorandum of Understanding that will allow for cooperation in several areas including food security and trade. The Ministers of Foreign Affairs will have to come up with us with tar targets that they will establish. How we can ensure that we develop the infrastructure to have all the hatching eggs in the region produced between the two countries. How we can expand our capacity for grains. How are we going to collaborate on climate change going into Glasgow? Because we have similar circumstances. We are already talking about how we can exchange ideas on education and health care. Because if we are going to build first class infrastructure in Guyana, then that infrastructure must be for the service of the region.